Well, good morning again. Please open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. Thank the Lord for the message out of Philippians chapter 4. <clears throat> the title is How to Escape. There's really two aspects of escape that was on my mind when I wrote that title, How to Escape. One is, um, is the means of salvation, to escape sin and death and torment. And it's so important to know how to escape sin and death and torment. And the other is how to escape this present evil world on a day-to-day -day grind basis. That the world is a, is a, the reality of life is difficult. It's difficult. And how to escape that? The, the answer is the same. Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. That, that, there's their answer to how to escape Rejoicing in God alone. Let let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God, which passeth all these things that are troubling us. All understanding shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. We're saved and kept with our mind on Christ. So the same way you're saved when your mind first is enlightened, that very first light, say, I really do see how beautiful and righteous Christ is and how evil I am. That's where you want to stay every day thereafter. When our minds are on Christ, we're relieved and we escape from this present world and our minds are heavenly. We can actually think on the, the heavenly Christ instead of the, the difficulties that we're going through. By way of introduction, can one be a accepted by God without hearing his word preached you live your think about it there's lots of people in this even in America or especially America that have never heard the gospel they hear supposed Christian preachers that talk about a false Christ with false doctrines uh, there's truths mixed in but once you mix one lie in with the true doctrines it all becomes a, a false doctrine and these are hearing right now uh, from pulpits all around America and all around the world that man has an ability and has an input to salvation and that's a lie. That's the fall, like as if man had power or ability to save themselves is the fall of, uh, that Adam fell in as the death. And those that are, in, that are in darkness are preaching and teaching darkness and death to people right now. But the answer is you have to hear about Christ and his righteousness. Galatians 2.16 says, knowing that a man is is not justified the, by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. We are justified by the faith of Christ. And we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. The faith that God gives his people is synonymous. It's the very same faith that Christ has. We have the mind of God in this world. Ephesians 2 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that, that faith, that's not of yourself. Faith is the gift of God. Man cannot learn God on their own. They cannot come to a higher understanding of doctrine. They cannot study enough to actually be accepted by God because they're dark. We, we fell in Adam. And we're from our very conception, we're dark and evil. The faith that relieves you and escapes the sin and death and corruption, the true escape, the faith that God gives, is the very mind of Christ. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. There has to be a spoken message by an authentic preacher, God-sent preacher, to explain the righteousness of Christ and how evil man is. Turn to Romans 3, please. There's a big debate in the Old Testament times about Jews versus the, all the other religions. And that's in the beginning of the New Testament times. There's a lot of accusations across the fence. Who's right? Who's wrong? Romans 3, 9 kind of levels the playing field. What then are we better than they? No, and no wise. For we have been, for we, for we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they 
are all under sin. It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or all the other religions. We're all born the same. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're all together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. There's Their throat's an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Fear of God is to consider yourself evil and to consider Christ as the only righteous one in all existence of all people of all times. The fear of God, they don't know fear of God. They think they themselves are righteous and that they can add to God by offering their works. There's no fear of God in their eyes. Now we know, verse 19, that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. You offend God in one law, you're guilty of them all. It shows there's no way you can justify yourself by being a good ethical person. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in God's sight. For, the, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The only reason why God gave the law is to make it extremely clear, plain, simple, for the youngest person in here to grasp, I'm a sinner. The law declares that if you offend in one area, you're guilty of 100% of the law. We can't fulfill even one of the laws. We're guilty of all of them. If we've ever sinned once, then... We need to escape death because it shows we're dead. We need to escape sin. It shows that we are sin. But we need to escape torment because it shows that we are conceived in the very throes of torments that God declares sinners are in. We need, we need to be relieved. We need to escape. And the escape is simple. Point one, the faith of Christ. Turn to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, verse 11, <coughs> the very kernel of faith of Christ is his, his substitutionary death on behalf of sinners. He shall see, verse 11, the travail of his soul. This is the father shall see the travail of his soul. The son's soul is going to travail and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, not any or all, many, a particular people shall be saved by the satisfaction of Christ's blood on behalf of their, of the of these sinners. <clears throat> For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins of many, and made intercession for his transgressors. Now, those of us that are transgressors, this is a delight. Those of us that need an escape, this is a delight. Because Christ says, look at verse 11. He shall see the travail of Christ's soul and shall be satisfied. The Father satisfied in only one thing, the substitutionary death of Christ. The very blood of Christ is the very object of Christ's faith. When he poured out his life on the cross of Calvary, Every bit of his life was pounded out of him in torments. That, that was what was due you, if you're ever to know Christ savingly. He took that on your behalf of himself. He's holy. He's righteous. He's pure. He didn't deserve any of that. But he took it in our place on the cross. His blood was poured out of his body. He died for us substitutionarily. Satisfying the demand of the law. And that's why it says, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. The very knowledge that the Father is satisfied with the blood of Christ. This is the faith of Christ. The knowledge, the awareness and understanding, the acknowledgement that the blood satisfies the Father's demand of death for sinners. And therein is the sinner's hope. The blood satisfied the Father. The blood satisfies my, my evil conscience. 
The blood of Christ satisfies all my doubts, all my fears, all the torments are gone when I see the blood has been shed for me. And Christ, seeing that his blood was shed, he said, that'll do. The Father's going to accept that. And that faith, that sureness and awareness that this is enough, and this is, it exceeds the demand of the Father. This is the very faith of Christ. And this same faith on the blood, looking to the blood of Christ and acknowledging that he's the only righteous one, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Turn back to our text. <clears throat> I read that the escape, whether it's for salvation or day-to-day -day deliverance out of this life, <laughs> the torments of this life, is to rejoice in the Lord. In verse 7 it says, The peace that God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, through His work for you, through His character, through His conduct. And that's what's explained in verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Think on these things. Be mindful of these things. Whatsoever things are honest, Christ is honest. Be mindful of Christ. Whatsoever things are just, be mindful of, the, of Christ, the just one. Whatsoever things are pure, be mindful of Christ, the pure one. Whatsoever things are lovely, he's lovely to his people. Whatsoever things are good, he's the only good one in all existence. If there be any virtue, if there be any praises, Think on Christ and his righteous person, his being, his substitutionary work. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard. See, you're saved through the hearing of the preaching. You're kept through the hearing of the preaching, of the very attributes of Christ, the very honor and goodness and righteousness of Christ. It's important. And see in me, do and, and, the, and the God of peace shall be with you. The God of peace is with you in your very mind. When your mind are on these characteristics of Christ. And I want to preach these characteristics. The first one is truth. Christ alone is true. Turn to John chapter 7 to see this. People have a hard time with truth nowadays. There's so much perversion. And truth is wrapped up in this statement. John chapter 7, verse 28. Jesus cried at the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and ye know who, whence I am, and I am not come of myself. But he that sent me is true. Here's the core of all truth. God the Father, whom ye knew not. You know not. So he's saying there's separation. There's some elect, and there's some that are reprobate. But I know him, for I am from him, and he has sent me. The Father of all truth, of only truth, sent his Son, who is truth. Truth resides within God alone. Outside of God, there's only deceit and lies. And Christ is the only honest one. Christ's Spirit says so. Turn to Romans 9, please. Romans chapter 9. Romans 9 verse 1 is where the Apostle Paul wrote, I say the truth in Christ, <laughs> the Son of truth. His Father is truth. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, who are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever, amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. The apostles Paul saying, those other people that were Jews, that weren't elect, it breaks his heart to know that they aren't going to be saved. It devastated him. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall the seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise 
are counted for the seed. There is an election. There is a particular people. Apostle Paul's grieving, grief stricken that some of the Jews that he's friends with and buddies with, they're not elect and they're going to be damned in their sin. For this is the word of the promise that at this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. And, and not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. The Apostle Paul is laying down clearly. It breaks my heart that some people that I know that are Jews, that are my friends, they're not elect. They're going to die in their sin. But there's a, a seed of promise that are the elect. And it has nothing to do with your personality. It has nothing to do with your morals or your ethics. It has to do with God's purpose to elect you before the foundation of the world and to choose you. It's his choice to save who he will. Election is honesty about who God is. And the Spirit only speaks this honest truth. God saves who he will. And the rest, they perish in their sin. This is the... <laughs> And the next point is the pureness of Christ's blood. Christ's blood is the only pure thing in all existence. You think you smelt down gold over and over again and get it pure? There's always some type of oxide there. You do a lot of things in this life and you say, this is pure chemical. It's not. There's only one pure substance in all existence. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is purity. This is righteousness. 1 Peter 1.19 says, you're redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Christ, sinless of himself, laid down his life for sinners, for the transgressors, for those of us that find out in our lifetime that we're evil and he's altogether lovely in righteousness. He's, his pure blood has been shed for you. The Father accepts that pure blood. Rest in the pure blood of Christ, not your works. And he's altogether lovely. This is where it says Christ is perfect. Turn to Song of Solomon, chapter 5. Song of Solomon is a love story between the bride, the elect of God the Father, and Christ, his son, who paid for us with his blood. And the world attacks the bride. They don't like us because we're elect of God the Father and loved. And they're not. Song of Solomon chapter 5, before I start reading verse 9, the people around the church accuse the church and try to strip our righteousness from us, try to make our eyes go away from our Savior. In verse 9, what is thy beloved more than another beloved, is what the false believers around us say. O thou fairest among women, they acknowledge that we're beautiful because we're beautiful in the blood of Christ and his purity, not of ourselves. What is thy beloved more than another beloved? They all have their own God. Why isn't it okay to worship God the way you want to worship him? Why, why isn't it okay to have multiple Christs and just worship the one that you define your way? My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. The church, my Christ is perfect. These are human examples of perfection. It's as close as you can get to the mind that sees what perfection is. His head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. He's perfect. He's perfect beyond the human mind's conception. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers. His lips like lilies dropping sweet smelling myrrh. He's perfect. Our Christ, his blood is pure and his person is perfect. His hands are as gold rings with, with uh, gemstones. His belly is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. His legs are as pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. He's perfect. Our Savior, our Jesus, is different than the world's Jesus. He's perfect. His mouth is most sweet. Yea, he's altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. This is the lovely person of Lord Jesus Christ. He is perfection beyond the human mind. And he's good. Turn to Acts chapter 10. 
to see the goodness of Christ. Peter preached boldly during his time on this earth. Peter in Acts 10 verse 34 opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. He's saying what I'm trying to say to you, it doesn't matter what your occupation is, it doesn't matter what your moral ethics are, it doesn't matter who you are, God says who he will. But in every nation, he that feareth him and that worketh righteousness is accepted with God. How do you? How can you be accepted by God? You fear him, consider yourself complete evil and Christ 100% righteous, perfect, pure Christ. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism with John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good. What's good? Healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Now that all is a powerful A-L-L. Those in their lifetime that, that never need salvation, never find out they're a prisoner, never find out that they're oppressed of the devil, and they're destitute and damned and deserve destruction, they didn't, Christ didn't die for you. But those of us that find out that we're oppressed of the devil, all of these folks, he saves and he healed all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him and and we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him, that's Christ, God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God. There's an election by grace of God that he's revealed. His death, burial, and resurrection is revealed to just the elect, just the chosen. Even to us who did eat and drink and with him after he rose from the dead. This lovely Savior, this pure Savior, this honest Savior, this true Savior reveals himself to those that are sinners. And in that moment, you see that he's all virtue. That woman that sought him out, that said, ah, oh, the high priest was just a picture of the Messiah. And now the Messiah is here on this earth. And if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be healed of this issue of blood. I know it because he's put his faith within me. And I look to his blood and his virtue and his righteousness for salvation. And she touched the hem of his garment. And what did Christ say? I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. He's the only one with virtue. He's the only one that can give you to escape eternal torment. And he's the only one that gives you to escape your day-to-day -day grind of whatever ails you, whatever hurts you, whatever frustrates you. Your mind's on that. Stop it. By God's grace, put your mind back on the one that's praiseworthy. Not your problem. Your problem's not praiseworthy. It's not worth your, your, your thought. Your thought ought to be on the praiseworthiness of Christ. That's the last point. Christ on his throne in heaven, it's revealed. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, even those things that torment the mind during our lifetime. He's created all things, heaven and hell. He's created the evil for the day of evil. And for thy pleasure, they are and were created. Everything is in the power of Christ. By God's grace, put your eyes on him. Whether it's for salvation or to get through the day-to-day -day grind, by God's grace, see that the escape isn't of yourself. You'll never do it. You'll never escape of yourself. You'll die and go deeper and deeper into, into torments and death. But by God's grace, looking to the Savior, looking to his faith, and your eyes on him, cast all your cares, all your cares, upon him and he cares for you. Rick closes some prayer, please.